What up, what up, what up? What's going on, everybody? You know who it is. This is Austin, and this is the Austin Smith Real Estate Podcast, where we talk about real estate, and you know we talk about lifestyle. Once again, we got another awesome guest that's coming to the show. Be prepared to have these gems dropped as we continue to share the sugar. And a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. If you haven't done so, definitely log on to austinsmithrealestate.com slash podcast. Be sure to subscribe to one of the platforms there. And if you have benefited by listening to the show, leave me a rating and review. And let's continue to share this message. So, without further ado, let's get into the show. What's going on, everybody? Today on the show, we have another awesome guest coming to us. And this guest is pretty interesting. The reason why is because uh, she retired from the entire 9 to 5 life at the young age of 32. So she's a full-time real estate investor. She's the founder of The Key Resource, which is her platform that educates, empowers, inspires people to take charge, especially those that are looking to get their feet wet in the field of real estate. And her real estate investments have afforded her to be able to retire from the nine to five life at such a young age. And we're going to dig right into that. And she currently owns and manages her units, which net her uh, actually, we'll talk about either that net or is that gross, but $150,000 a year in rental income. So, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce you to the investor, the speaker, the coach, the inspirer, Kendra Barnes. Kendra, thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show today. Hey, thank you for having me. Super excited. We'll dump right into it. Uh, tell us first how you got started, uh, where are you coming from, you know, first and foremost, and, and talk to us how you got started. Yeah, so I'm from a little bit of everywhere because I'm a military brat, so I don't really know, like, one place to say I'm from, but um, my rental properties are in D.C. and Maryland, and I got started kind of randomly. Like, I don't come from a family of investors. I don't come from a wealthy family. Uh, my parents were both in the Air Force, so I grew up. Uh, middle class, you know, but I didn't really grow up just knowing I was going to be an investor. My husband and I actually, um, we played this game called cash flow randomly, like six or seven years ago, probably seven years ago now. And it just opened our eyes. We were like, wait a minute. Like, so we played the game one day and then the next day we were, we were out looking for our next rental property. It just kind of switched this light bulb on like so quickly have you played cash flow before is that um uh robert kiyosaki's game yeah robert kiyosaki's i, I have author. i have not i have mm-hmm. not yet so yeah now i gotta put um, that on the on the list you have to play it i think you'd really enjoy it it's uh for anyone who's listening he's the um, guy who wrote rich dad poor dad which is a really famous book like in the investing world but it's, the game is similar to Monopoly, but it's a lot better because it really mimics life. And so you have a job, you have a salary, you have like student loans, you know, depending on your profession, you have kids, you know, you might have kids, you might not. And basically you're making this paycheck and you're kind of just going through the motions of life. You're paying bills, you're going to work, paying bills, going to work. But you have this dream that at the beginning of the game, you have to set forth what your dream is, like what's your dream life. But the only way to live that dream is if you make smart investments that allow you to become financially free. And so we we played that game at a time when we were both working for the government, making good money, living really well, but we were not building wealth. We were not making our money make money. And we never thought about it. Like we, we thought we had reached like this American dream, right? Got a good job and we had a nice house and things like that. But the game kind of, Uh, like I said, switched on this light bulb, like, wait, our money is not even making money. It's so crazy. So that's kind of what catapulted the whole real estate journey. The, uh, well, I remember, and I tell this story all the time. I remember playing uh, Monopoly. Well, well, not even playing, but I remember uh, one Thanksgiving recently within the past uh, few years, um, I remember bringing the the game Monopoly because I was telling my family, 
uh, hey, let's go play a board game. Let's like, you know, do like old times. Let's bring out the board games. Let's go play. And I remember bringing out Monopoly. And for me, I had, I had, I didn't play Monopoly often. The only time I really saw Monopoly was when I was younger. And, you know, it was just another board game amongst all the other board games that we played as, as children. But when I pulled this game out, I pulled this game out, sit on the table and I'm going through the directions and I'm like, this is nowhere near like a kid's game at all. Like this is a full blown on how to dominate like wealth wise wrapped up mm-hmm. into a board game and some dice. And I guess mm-hmm. I just didn't re- like, you know, I knew what a monopoly was in a, in a business term, but I never, because I wasn't, you know, touching the game of monopoly like that. It was, you know, it was crazy shocking of how, real world and tangible these games are and exactly what we're doing kind of in real life so i i can see how that particular game cash flow can play that part and obviously it's changed your life so let's talk about that because first things first thank you for your your service um to the country especially uh considering the fact that i know me personally Uh, I'm obviously not the one that signed up and there are people that will uh, provide service for this country, even though they may not, you know, agree with everything. So we thank you for that for sure. (laughs) Oh yeah. My parents definitely, I I definitely am not cut out for military service, but my parents, they are, they're really awesome for, for doing that. So thank you. Um, So so that was your family. Okay. Yes. Well, thank you. Oh yeah. Yeah. My parents. Gotcha. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I'm not, I'm not the one either. <laughs> I, I got you. Okay, so uh, you mentioned that your properties are in uh, the D.C. and Maryland markets. You mentioned now D.C. If I'm correct, now that's an expensive market. Are you doing these deals in an in, in, in expensive market? Oh, it's really expensive. It wasn't okay. as expensive whenever we started, uh, when, when we got our first rental six years ago. Actually, before we got into real estate investing, we bought our first home. And that was, I guess, seven years ago. But um, we got a short sale, which means we basically got a house for like half off on clearance, if you kind of think of it like retail. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, D.C. is expensive, but there are ways to to kind of still get in. Um, it's harder now, but yeah, we, we definitely are investing in an expensive market. I got you. So was the first, um, uh, the first rental property, was that in D.C. or was that in uh, Maryland? It was in D.C. and it was in what people will call the hood, call it what you want, but it, real estate is a numbers game. But, yeah, we definitely bought our first uh, rental in D.C. It was a duplex. Okay, so let's talk about that. Uh, how did you find it? How did you fund it? Kind of run through the numbers with us. What were we looking at? How did you know that it was a good deal, considering the fact that it was in, quote, unquote, the hood, which is where all the gold is? But talk Yes. <laughs> So we found we had a real estate agent and she was sending us listings, but we also were looking ourselves. We were looking on Redfin and Zillow and Trulia. So I definitely suggest people have a real estate agent, a really good one that can be your advocate. But you can still look on websites yourself and and do your own research and um, get your agent involved. So we found this new place ourselves, I think, on like Redfin or something. And honestly, we did not know what the heck we were doing because we had never studied anything about real estate investing. We never took a course. Back then, I'm, I'm acting like it was like ages ago, but back then, like there were no podcasts with young black people talking about real estate. There was no one on Instagram like me or anyone else, like my other investor friends who were kind of showing people that it was possible and like how to do it and stuff like that. And so for me, all I saw was like, or when I thought of investor, I thought of an old white white man. <laughs> <laughs> and um And so when I tell you we didn't know what we were doing, we really we knew it was a good idea. We're like, okay, we should be investing. And we saw this duplex and we ran some really elementary numbers like, okay, the mortgage is this. We're going to make around this much from rental income based on what we see here. And okay, let's do it. And it it turned out to be a really good deal. We still own that duplex to this day. Um, But we just kind of jumped off the cliff. And what I tell people is. On one hand, you really do need to educate yourself and do better than I did and and really know what you're doing. But really, the action, taking action and getting that experience is going to be your best teacher. 
So it's really tough because with all the information overload with podcasts and Instagram and the courses and the eBooks, people get into this like analysis paralysis, but you really have to take action once you've, you know, educated yourself. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. And, and simple 10 X action. Like mm-hmm. I, that's one thing I've learned, you know, recently over, over, I would even say just the past month uh, of just what consistent focus action on a 10 X level, but on something that's very simple, it's, mm-hmm. it's mind blowing. So, uh, I definitely agree with that. Was this, uh, did this need any rehab where, you know, did you need to fix it up? Was it moving ready and how did you fund it? Oh yeah. I forgot to answer that part. Sorry. No, no problem. Um, no, no problem. So yeah, it was a duplex. One unit already had a tenant in it and one did not. Um, it was $228,000 for the duplex. We actually funded it using a conventional loan. So that means that we had to put 25% down and we did not have 25%. So I think the, uh, I can't remember the exact number, but I think it was like $57,000 we needed for closing. Um, we had not been saving for a rental property because we played a game that inspired us to like take action the next day. We didn't find it the next day. It took us about three months to find it, mm-hmm. but we hadn't saved up. So we ended up pulling that money from our retirement account, um, which I would say if anyone is interested in doing that, make sure you talk to a financial advisor. It worked beautifully for us, but that's not going to be the case for everyone. But basically when you're taking that loan from your retirement, you're taking a loan from yourself. And then you're paying yourself back with interest. And we were able to make way more money on that money by putting it into that property than having it sit in our retirement account. So like I said, it's not going to be that case for everyone. So we um, use that for the down payment, the loan from our retirement account. Uh, The mortgage was a little over $1,000. The tenant that was in there at the time was paying, um, I think he was paying like, $1,200. $1,200. So we were like, cool, the mortgage is 1000 He's paying $1,200. Um, the unit that was empty needed a little bit of work, just cosmetic stuff. So we're like, cool, we got a tenant, the mortgage is covered. We're going to kind of take our time and bootstrap this, you know, cosmetic makeover thing. And we're good. What happened is like a week after we closed on that property, the tenant just up and left. Like he didn't even warn us. He just moved <laughs> out. And we were like, wait like how do we find tenants we hadn't even thought about yeah we were like wait a minute we didn't we we we, we thought we were set so we didn't think about like okay how do you find tenants what's a contingency plan and so it ended up forcing us to get creative and we put um the apartment on airbnb just to make money until we could figure something out and that ended up being like the best thing to ever happen because we were able to make like three times the market rent by putting it on Airbnb. And so wow. um, we kind of got addicted from there. We're like, man, this money is good. Like, right. let's do this again and again. <laughs> so, uh, and it's into, okay, so you, two things. One, I like the fact that, you know, and especially it has to be a mentality adopted by investors or at least people that are striving to be investors because in your particular case, 25% down, you said about $57,000 or so, you don't have the money, and it wasn't just the, oh, oh, well, I tried, you know, let's wait, let's save, let's wait, let's slow, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? And mm-hmm. sometimes when the deal calls, the deal calls, and you have to figure out a way to put it together. And, you know, I just like the fact that you... Uh, and your husband asked yourself, how can we afford it? And you found another mm-hmm. alternative, which honestly, I think was even better because now you're one. Now you're not using kind of your cash that you just, you know, gained access to. You're mm-hmm. doing something that already kind of was being invested. So mm-hmm. you're using money because that, you know, the cash that you took from your retirement, uh, retirement account, you didn't open a retirement account and then put that exact amount of money in there. That money right. grew from whatever it was originally. So now you're almost technically playing with house money to now go and mm-hmm. get another asset, which then brings more in value. And you can obviously see how that domino effect can be, uh, ex- you know, exponentially can grow your wealth. So yeah now uh the airbnb model you that are you are you still doing airbnb in the other units as well or or was that just this one 
No, we um we did Airbnb for about three or four years, but we stopped and put uh, for, uh, a long-term tenant in that unit. But I do want to pause and say that I wish I would have known about house hacking at that point because mm-hmm. we would have saved so much money. Like that down payment could have gone from $57,000 to like $8,000 <laughs> because yeah, no. if we would have lived in one unit and rented out the other, just by making it our primary residence, we could have used FHA. We could have gotten down payment grants and things like that. And mm-hmm. so we didn't even know. And honestly, I wasn't at the, I wasn't in a wealth building mindset yet. Like I, I wasn't ready to make sacrifice. We had a really big house. It was very nice. We had like all these nice things. And I don't think I was, I know, no, I know I wasn't in a place where I would have wanted to downsize, but I know now, and we ended up house hacking later, uh, we house hacked a four unit, um, that you have to make sacrifice when you're building wealth from the ground up, like you have to make short-term sacrifices. But that's one thing that I wish I had known was about house hacking. Yeah, yeah, totally understand. I, Yeah, I'm a house hacker. I believe in the whole house hacker mentality. And, um, mm-hmm. you know, I'm, I'm blessed to have my wife on board, considering the fact that I had uh, her in the basement uh, for a little bit before we moved into the other unit. But again, it was it was the sacrifice. It, now mm-hmm. that so much time, you know, time has gone by and it honestly feels like a, you know, a blur on how much time was actually spent there. Yep. But uh, then again, <laughs> it was the best deci- like best decision. So yeah. uh, I, I totally understand. So any particular reason why you decided to go back to the traditional uh, tenant model instead of Airbnb? Was it the uh, constant turnover or, or, you know, what was the reason? Any particular? No. So Airbnb is very high maintenance, um, but the, the return is amazing. The only reason we stopped is because we ended up moving to Texas. My husband's job before we both retired his job moved us to Texas and we just didn't want to have to manage Airbnb from afar. So we just put a, um, a full uh, time tenant in there and um, that's that. But now we're doing a little bit of everything. So we've done section eight tenants, you know, regular tenants, if that's what you'll call them, Airbnb. And then we, right now we're doing a travel nurse rentals as well. in one of our, um, in one of our rentals and basically travel nurses, they tra- they travel um, every three months mm. to a different hospital around the country and they're really great tenants. Interesting. Okay. So, we, okay. so we're actually going to uh, talk about, um, you know, just you going on to the next properties, but you know, it's so interesting to hear people say, you know, when we retired and obviously you were able to do that at a young age, what, mm-hmm. what does retirement look like i know a lot of people might think that it's you know i guess chilling with a florida shirt and playing shuffleboard (laughs) and like you know so what what is what does retirement look like for you it's really so it's really just like the freedom of not having to exchange time for money like i don't have to be anywhere at any particular time in order to pay my bills but that doesn't mean that I still don't do money making activities. Like we still have our investments, which we love like managing and always looking for new deals. Um, I love what I'm doing at the key resource. So that's like teaching classes, doing courses and things like that. Honestly though, whenever, whenever we retired, which it's been a year now, literally in about a week or so, it'll be a year to the date for me. My husband retired a few months before me, but Um, we had planned on traveling the world for a year and we ended up getting pregnant, which was not part of the plan. So we, we had to put that little traveling plan to the side and I just had a baby. So um, thank you. So um, now retirement looks like for us, like pouring a lot of time into our daughter and everything, which is really cool. But I think people do have this idea of retirement that you're like old and you're just sitting and watching tv all day but for us it's like just doing whatever we want to do just the freedom of like making our own well no we do whatever our daughter tells us to do <laughs> right Understood. now but, Understood. Um, but yeah it's, it's been pretty cool so far and you know through uh the key resource you're you're also helping like a bunch of people do pretty much the same thing and you know i've seen the testimonials and people are really starting to, you know, kind of change their financial outlook. I know, um, 
you know, what are some of the other things that kind of you're offering people? I know you, I, I saw the 90 day action plan. What's mm-hmm. what's how how does that help people jumpstart, you know, their investing career? Like tell how did they basically take the next move that you did mm-hmm. where you played cash flow and then the next day you started working your way towards owning your first how did how can you help others do that? Yeah, with with the key resource, my biggest thing to people is like representation. Like you can do this. Yes, you can be young. Yes, you can be black. Yes, you can be a woman. You can be single. You can be, you know, whatever, wherever you are, you can start. You're worthy of wealth. That's the first thing, knowing knowing that you're worthy Mm, and that you're capable. I like that. Yes. That's a mindset shift. Yes. And I think when people see themselves like reflected in my story, it empowers them. And so that's why I'm really big. But I also don't want to make it to where people feel like you have to invest in real estate and you're late and you need to rush and get yourself in a, you know, a situation that is not, you know, good for your finances. It, it, so it gets really tricky. My thing to people is like, just make sure your money is making money. If you can't invest right. in real estate right now, try something else, like get to a point where you can um, ownership is really important. So my thing is like just inspiration, first of all. But the education piece is making sure that people are not making the same expensive mistakes that I did. Like, you know, be aware of grants and things out there. Know about house hacking. Know, uh, you know, about how to find tenants and like screen process, like different things like that. So with things like the 90-day 90 uh, 90 action plan, it's basically kind of giving people that push they need because I think people hear real estate investing and it's like, Scary. Wait, I, I can yeah, I can just go out there and just do this on my own. I don't you're like, yeah, you don't need any kind of certification. You don't need to be a real estate agent. Like, yeah, you can do this. And so it's kind of just helping nudge people in the right direction. Love it. Awesome. And so let's uh, transition as we uh, kind of start our descent here. You you've had success with the first property, but obviously it took a couple properties in order to benefit from, you know, kind of early retirement. So let's talk about your transition into going after the next properties. How did you how did you find those? Did you do another 25 percent? I know you mentioned that you house hacked one of them. Was that with a 25 percent loan or was that with a, you know, a low down payment loan? Just uh, run us through the process of going after the next properties? Yeah, so the next property we bought was a four unit and we house packed and we put down 3.5% uh, with FHA. We would have never been able to afford this place if we had not house packed. Um, the four unit building in DC cost $800,000 and the down payment, um, I think we ended up coming to closing with like, a little under 20,000, maybe 17. I need to do the math, but um, let's just say 20,000. Um, and it, with the way, you know, qualifying for multi-unit work is they basically qualify you based on your income and the income that you're gonna make with these units. And if you know anything about the DC market, the rental income is really high. And so that's how we were able to get such an expensive building. If not for house hacking, we would have never been able to afford that. Now, um, and, now, mm-hmm. uh, now with FHA, now, mm-hmm. some people know that you can use FHA multiple times. I know me and my wife mm-hmm. used FHA multiple times. And I think we're getting ready to use it for the final time. Um because I would be shocked if I was able to do another FHA loan after this, after the next purchase, because at that point, like, it's like all hell is going to break loose. Like, I'm just going to blast this to the world that, you know, I've used FHA four and five times. Like, it would be absolutely absurd. But oh my goodness. In, in this particular case, um, did the bank not have, because I know sometimes there there has to be a quote unquote upgrade. Now, I don't know if the markets are different and how they Mm -hmm. mortgage process, you know, they do their underwriting. But here, Mm -hmm. uh, at least if you're in the same area, so in this case, you know, D.C., it's really, really hard to go from, even if you own a duplex, it's really, really hard to go from a duplex to a four family using FHA. But obviously in this particular case, you were able to do that. Yeah, well, we didn't use FHA on the duplex. So, right, but even with even mm-hmm. with the conventional loan, uh, not to say that you're not able to use it. I, I just know that there's some friction. Not to say that it can't be done, but 
And uh, then there's usually some okay. friction when going from a two to a four, or basically the underwriter's asking a lot more, like, really, oh, are, yes. are you sure you're going to live there? Because that's their, you know, that's what they're trying to protect. Oh, yes. But, oh, that's what, yes. They, uh, you know, they ask us actually some really inappropriate questions. Too, yeah, think about I was going to say, because they, I'm doing a refinance and they're all in, but I'm like, you know, wow, okay. Do we really need to know that info? Yeah, I actually ended up filing a complaint with the Better Business Bureau on the lender <laughs> that we used that time because we were going from, we had the duplex, we didn't live there. We lived in a single family house, like I said, really nice, like custom closets in the master bedroom, but we had a movie theater room, we had a garage, we had a backyard, which is wow. very uncommon in, in D.C. Like, you're not going to find a single family house with a garage in a cul-de-sac in D.C. Like, you, you're not going to find it. And mm. we're telling the lender that we're going to move into a four unit apartment building. And they're like, they literally asked us, uh, when do you plan on having kids? Like, are you pregnant right now? And I'm like, that's wow. none of your business. Yeah. Wow. So to me, that was really inappropriate. But to your point, the lender is trying to hedge risk. And they're like, if you plan on expanding your family as a married couple, why are you moving into this small right. apartment in a four unit when you have this beautiful home? Um, but still, it's none of their business. Like I'm not, I'm building wealth. Okay, <laughs> like that's what I'm doing. I haven't, I haven't even. Uh, I wonder if I can use that. Like, listen, I'm building wealth. Like that's, it's just that simple. <laughs> I, I, some of them I fluff it a little bit, and you know, better area, better school district, better this and better that. It's bigger, mm -hmm. yada yada. But I, I, I'm gonna try it for for one of the last ones. I'm gonna try it. Like, listen, like me and my wife are just out here building wealth. Is that an issue? and just see what they yeah. say. You can try it. Yeah, every vendor is so different, but it actually ended up being we were moving into a better neighborhood, um, and so I think that's what worked because our single-family house um, was in southeast D.C., and we were moving to northeast, so. Okay, got you, got you. The, did you find the next deal and probably the subsequent deals, are these also um, you working with your agent, finding them on the MLS? Um, yes, except for one that we bought cash, uh, our condo, we actually, it was like an off market, just a friend of a friend was like, Hey, I know you're in real estate. They have this condo and the numbers were just like way too good to be true. It was a condo that needed no work. It had a tenant in it paying 1250 a month and they just wanted 45,000 for it. So we we're like, yes, let's sign us oh, up. And interesting. I mean, yeah, you just start making money from day one. The return was crazy. No renovation needed good tenant yeah and that's Sold. what i mean like with with investing like i tell people all the time and i'll say this part and we'll start the uh, uh core four the like the it's so easy to get emotional in real estate investing that if you just focus on the numbers everything else will take care of itself like if you focus mm -hmm. and check on the numbers if you protect the downside the upside takes care of itself and mm -hmm. I can easily see so many people shying away from that deal because it's a quote unquote condo. And for whatever reason, you know, some people just have this negative connotation towards condos and that they're, you know, not the best investment and they're not, you know, if the tenant moves out, you're paying it yourself and yada, yada, yada. But, you know, I mean, I guess risk is reward. And if that opportunity yeah. presents itself, you might as well take advantage of it. Like why, you know, why not? Um, so yeah, the the I like how you went after that move because I just said you know factor in everything taxes, HOA fees, whatever you know what's coming in versus what's coming out. Yep, yep. And condos can be tricky though. I mean, there are some cons, but with numbers like that, we're like we'll take the risk. <laughs> right, right. It, it was worth it. Um, last question before the core four: uh, What's next for you? Is it is it more buying? Is it you know, are you going to do flips? Is it just mainly buy and holds? What's, what's, you know, what's the long-term plan? Yeah, I do want to try my first flip this year. I've never flipped. I've never wholesaled. I've only ever done like buy and hold, but um, I definitely, we are focusing on opportunity zone investments uh, this year. So buying an opportunity zone, possibly investing in an opportunity zone fund, but that's that's our focus for the for 2020. And for the people that don't know really quick what an opportunity uh, zone and fund is, uh, just elaborate on that. Yeah, so it's a, a great new uh, tax incentive for investors. Basically, if you realize any gains from investing, so you sell stocks or you sell real estate or 
or what have you, you're going to be taxed on those gains. But basically, if you invest in opportunity zones or opportunity zone funds, uh, Google it, look at the IRS definition, and, and they have a lot of great uh, Q&A on their website. But you can defer taxes. Um, so it, it's just basically it's one of these things that people in the government have created to keep themselves wealthy. And <laughs> I'm going to be using it to keep myself wealthy as well. It, that's a that's how a lot of things are uh, surprisingly, and you know now our goal and the individuals that are doing it, uh, kind of the responsibility is really just educating people that listen mm-hmm. the the same things that were put in place to keep things in a certain order and in a certain system. You can now mm-hmm. use that, you know, in reverse completely. Mm-hmm. And, uh, mm-hmm. you know, it, it's extremely powerful stuff. It's it's that I didn't realize until I got into business and just yeah. how economics work just on the on the wealthy scale and what things are placed, you know, put in place to do that and how to take advantage of that, that it's it's really mind blowing just and, and it's definitely needed just on the financial literacy piece, because mm-hmm. like you said, just, you know, uh, just earning the paycheck, not doing anything with it and not, you know, even finding ways to save more of the paycheck can, uh, you know, can be detrimental. So you're absolutely right on that. Yeah. And um, what you're going to see with Opportunity Zones is basically if you like literally Google whatever city you're in, like, I don't DC Opportunity Zones or whatever, wherever you are listening to this, you should see a map. And what you'll see is the Opportunity Zones are in the hood and this is going to really speed up gentrification because investors are basically being incentivized to pour millions of dollars into these areas for um, tax deferment. And so gentrification is really going to like <laughs> really, really happen uh, very quickly because of this. And so people feel different kind of ways about gentrification. However you feel, it's going to happen. It's been planned for years and years. So for me, I'm like, I may as well as a black person be a part of it and and, you know, instead of letting others that are not native to the community, you know, benefit alone. So, and I mean, the core the core concept of gentrification is just turning something, quote unquote, ugly and making it beautiful. Right. Yeah. And, but yep. socially and systemically, obviously, uh, we've been handed the short end of the stick on that, that particular yep. concept. So understandable. But now I feel like is the perfect time where the education is out there. We know there's nothing worse than anticipating it and then not doing nothing about it. This is the best opportunity that we now have to now have the community dollars benefit Mm -hmm. from the outside community dollars. And the outside community dollars, honestly, is just the gasoline that's on the fire. But if you're Mm -hmm. in in community dollars is put in place ready for that fire, that like when it comes, like you continue to benefit tremendously. And honestly, probably more than if the outside community money was not present. Mm-hmm. As the, as far as the reality of the situation, so yeah, we can we can talk about that all day. But anyway, uh, starting <laughs> our descent here, going into the core four, which are the four questions that I ask each and every guest on the Austin mm-hmm. Smith Real Estate Podcast. Question number one: What is your favorite aspect about real estate? Oh my gosh, so many things! But I, I love that my tenants can like see me as a young black, you know, woman, landlord and homeowner, and it can inspire them and their children that they can be homeowners too. Awesome. Question number two, favorite business or personal development book? Uh, the One Thing. By Gary Keller. That's a good one. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, awesome book. Everybody should uh, have that on their bookshelf. Uh, question number three, what are some of the fun things that you like to do In your spare time, when you're not educating, when you're not leading, when you're not being a mom, when you're not being a real estate investor, putting deals together, (laughs) what are the fun things that you like to do in your spare time? I am like a do-it-yourself fanatic, so I'm always building something, creating something, doing some kind of like craft project. Awesome. And then, you know what, it saves you uh, like a lot of money. That's a fact. Because it wasn't mm-hmm. until I became a landlord and it's just like, hey, listen, you can continue to <laughs> pay individuals to come out or you're going to have to figure out how to fix this thing yourself. 
and <laughs> you'd be surprised when you put in that situation and I became Bob the Builder or at least on certain things like not you know electrical work I I stick to the pros but yeah. little basic <laughs> stuff I I can now handle so awesome question number four last and not least where can people find you at Kendra um, you can find me on Instagram at the key resource. And um, once you get there, just click the link in my bio. You can find everything there, my website, you know, what have you. And um, DM me if you heard me on this podcast. I would love to chat with you guys. Awesome. Awesome. Kendra, thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show. Uh, I hope people just have just some actionable steps. That's my goal for each and every episode that the uh, listeners, the viewers, can leave away with something actionable and they definitely have that there it's up to them to implement it but you're living proof retired a retiree that doesn't even sound right but you're, you're a retiree <laughs> at uh 32 years young and obviously your family is reaping the benefits of some very smart uh actionable decisions that you've been able to make and you've now been able to convince us that it is possible so everyone that's listening viewing check out kendra on social media check out her website if you have any questions be sure to reach out let's continue to build wealth one house at a time here we go kendra thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show thank you enjoy keep grinding